I am officially offering one-to-ones. I came to find that a lot of what people were asking the DBA was not necessarily DBA work. Uh, there were questions I could have answered for them, or there was no question at all. It was just more so a need for clarity, which I can most definitely help in that aspect. Using a one-to-one -one session app known as People Talk. The link is below, and you can ask a one-off question with the app, or you can schedule a 30-minute one-to-one. But of course, if we need to go a little bit over, I'm very okay with that. Now, if you need to understand your current situation spiritually from an ancestral perspective, or maybe you feel that you have the calling to be a Debia or some type of calling you're not being able to decode, or you're receiving messages that aren't 100% clear and you want to know what to do next, or maybe you have general questions about Odinani and Igbo spirituality, as well as how to apply these principles to solving internal and external conflicts and feel that a solution rooted in ancestral science will be best. You can schedule a meeting at peopletalk.com slash the medicine show. And like I said, the link is below. And so that is people talk slash the medicine show. Pricing is different for AZ tier patrons. So if you're an AZ tier patron, message me first. Show. The last big announcement. I am currently working on a documentary. It is my next documentary, and the topic will be the Ekumeku resistance waged in the Anyama region of Igbo land against the British Empire. But this documentary will go a lot further than that. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to explore secret fighting societies and cults of resistance, not just in Igbo land, but in North America the Caribbean, South America, and throughout the African continent. So if you're interested in seeing this documentary, you can help us reach 300 patrons by joining patreon.com slash the medicine show. This is my first documentary since the Osu Explained video, which I've linked below. And I'm going all out with this one. I'm very confident you'll be happy about the final result. And with that being said, let's begin. Uh, Obehi, thanks thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Derek Ofaderungwa. Um, I am a researcher by profession. I call myself a student teacher. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewafo. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. At all times, I am researching um, the Igbo um, cosmological system and history and then presenting it, what I learn and what I deduce uh, to the uh, rest of the world. Um, I work I work on documentaries, videos, things like that. Um, I'm also the uh, founder for Gedu.me. Now, Gedu.me is a full language and custom school um, where we take a very unique approach to teaching. Um, in order to effectively teach uh, the uh, Igbo language um, and customs in the Igbo culture. So anybody who is interested in reconnecting with their culture or if they plan on visiting um, Nigeria, just different, whichever reason brings you to the table, we get you ready for um, the uh, success in that, in, that, in, that, in that way. So, Wait, Where actually were you born? Because right now, tell me where you were born and where exactly you are right now. Yeah, um, so... Um, I was born in a very, 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 very small, very white town called Kearney, Nebraska. Um, I was born there. I was raised partly there. And then I was raised partly at home. Um, so I think there's a mix of all of that in uh, maybe my uh, the way I speak. Um, but at the moment, I'm currently in uh, Houston, Texas. I am visiting family for Memorial uh, for the Memorial Day week. And um, we're having a holiday here in the U.S. And then from there, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, have you ever been to Nigeria? Um, yeah. Have you have you ever lived in Nigeria? Tell me about your experience here. Okay. No. First, tell me about your experience there as you were growing up as a young boy there in Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. It, it was a lot better than people would assume. Um, when we were in Nebraska, my parents went to uh, school at the University of Nebraska. And I don't know how much you follow Nigerian politics, but there was this politician uh, from Imo State, uh, which is my home state, uh, called Sam Mbakwe. 
and or was it Sam Buck? One of them, one of the, the, the big guys. And he had gone to the University of Nebraska for college. And so when he came back and he was so successful in life, everybody in my area was seeing the University of Nebraska as like what you would now see Harvard and Oxford as, right? So there was this flood of students that applied to go there and many of them got accepted into the uh, Kearney campus. Uh, Kearney is a town, I, if Kearney has, if Kearney has, 8,000 people, I'd be surprised. Um, but uh, maybe 8,000 or so people, small college town. Then all of a sudden you get this influx of Nigerians coming out of nowhere. Um, most of them were chased off, <laughs> but my parents stayed. Uh, my parents stayed, so I ended up growing up in Nebraska um, for a lot of times. Like, for example, we lived in one town where we were the only black family. Um, we had, uh, I was the only black male child, I guess, for a minute, not counting my brothers. Um, we had some Zimbabweans move in, and I remember that being uh, like, a, you know, a big deal to me at the time, but they left very quickly because they have sense. <laughs> uh, but in the middle of living there, we, um, we lived back home in Nigeria um, for about three to four years, um, three to four years. And um, entirely in the village entirely in the village so i've been uh hopping from village to village on two continents so yeah mm, that's that's interesting that, that means you have opportunity to be able to learn a lot of things now no because a lot of the richness is actually in the village okay but the village so that you don't have the money but a lot of the the code of life is actually um a shrine there in the village so your first time in Africa, your first time in Nigeria, in Nemo State in this case. Tell me about how old were you then and what did you tell me about the experience? Yeah, I was oh, how old was I when we landed? Probably about four, four or five, uh, roughly that age. I remember us coming in. I remember when we were in Kearney, my dad sat us down and was telling us that, oh, it's like a paradise and da -da -da, all these, he's telling us all these things, you know, and we're going to be treated so well and all this stuff. And so we landed and I remember, you know, you're very young, so you don't remember too much from like that first initial day, but my first day, I remember very well. One of the things that stuck out to me was I had, um, we had gummy worms. And uh, there was this old woman, <laughs> one of my old aunties, you know, like very old woman. She thought that, you know, maybe she thought there were real worms or something. But I remember it being very funny to us that she would run when she'd see them. Right. Um, so from the beginning, we were um, just running crazy. It was, you know, when you're in the village, you have a lot of freedom. So there's a lot of freedom. So just running everywhere, climbing everything, doing whatever. It's one of the best places to for a small child to be, right? So because you're not thinking of the things that the place doesn't have, you're thinking about all of the things it does have, such as an abundance of kids, um, lots of adventure places to go, things like that. Uh, go inside the bush, look for this and look for that, that kind of thing. So I was, you know, I, I acclimatized very quickly and very well um as a child um and then you know after you know when you, you you first get there you have the you know you get the new person hospitality then after that it was you know i was you know fighting people and doing all of the normal village activities so. <laughs> but we were there for about um between the ages of about four to eight you know about four to eight and so by the time i was eight you know we moved back to america and I remember by the time I was moved back to America, I'd completely forgotten what it was like in the US. I entirely, the only connection I had were VHS videos. My dad used to send back with different movies and cartoons and things like that on them. And so like, for example, I had forgotten like, uh, you know, we, we don't milk too often at home or it's not as much as they do in America anyways, unless it's like powdered milk. So I had forgotten what milk tasted like. And I, I remember thinking like, it was gonna taste like candy, like I just they make it look so good on TV, you know. I remember when I landed, I drank it, learned that I was lactose <laughs> intolerant, learned to learn that it didn't taste good. I remember coming to America, everything smelling like plastic. I don't know, uh, it's a very strange thing that's like one of these little strange things that I pick up, but I remember everything smelling like when you open a toy. That's when I was a child. I was the, the smell of the country was like when you open a toy. That smell, 
that kind of thing. Just you remember little things that, you know, are pertinent to a little kid. Um, but yeah, the, the, the experience was an experiment in acclimatizing very fast to radically different. Okay, now, um, how did you get started with this project relating to Igbo culture and Igbo cosmology? Because those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so I have a YouTube channel called The Medicine Show. And what I do is I go into Igbo spirituality, cosmology, and so forth. It is very hard for me to say this is the origin point or where this is, this is uh, where it began. Because by the time I started, it felt like an accumulation of things that had been building over a while, right? So one of the first, if I want to take it back to my interest and so forth, was in the village. Um, I was fascinated by masquerades. I was very into masquerades. I was just fascinated by them. I wanted to know everything that was going on about them. I was trying to deduce meaning. I remember I was pretty young when I found out that there's a masquerade we have called Ekeleke. And I figured out that it's supposed to be some kind of bird. And I felt like the smartest person in the world for figuring that out and things like that. Because, you know, they don't tell you, you just you experience it. And then after a while, you start seeing things when your mind matures, you know. And so um, was masquerades. When we were younger, we used to do uh, one called Mwechim, where it's very similar to uh, what in the West we would call Halloween, where children would make their own masquerade and they would go door to door and dance and then you receive money. Uh, and that kind of thing. And I remember me and my cousin and Mecca, who um, we reincarnate from the same person, and I can explain that later. We reincarnate from the same person, and we always had the same interests. So we were both into this witch and thing. We were both into uh, um, what we call Ukushi Manjala. I'm saying it incorrectly, but it's like a bottle cap soccer. Um, I don't know if you've ever played that. Uh, we're all we're both very uh, into the same things. And so him and I would just kind of explore these things together and go door to door with our witch and then all that stuff um and then i come back i come to the u.s you know of course you don't have those things around you but i'm constantly reading history i'm constantly reading about these different uh these uh, topics and so forth so around uh, i want to call it 2017 2018 um i feel i had gone very far in studying history but i always felt that there were gaps right? That things that weren't necessarily explained in a logical way, right? One of the big ones that made me really start thinking um, about taking some of these things that have been floating around in my life more seriously was when I was studying the Haitian Revolution, right? And the role that our um, African spirituality and African, I call it African sciences, had in making that a success especially consider the odds that the Haitians were against. They were fighting the French, uh, who were at the time the world's most powerful military. We've all heard of Napoleon, right? Uh, they defeated Napoleon, I want to say, two to three times uh, consecutively and so forth. So I was like, okay, how do people go from being enslaved to immediately, and I mean, just building these very advanced fortifications um, with uh, African architecture and um, being able to just muster the courage to do that, right? And so I started looking more into it, but I was initially looking into it in the sense of, you know, like a researcher, like, okay, I want to know the ups and downs of this and this and that. And you, you touch one thing and an entire world ex exposes itself and you go a little further and the entire world exposes itself. Next thing you know, you begin to see things um, in a different light a different light and so the journey began from many different places and when they all finally came together around the time i started the channel i was in the process of writing a book and i was like i want to write a book and i want it i want it to take place in um uh the uh older eras in evil land right i try to avoid the term pre-colonial we need a better term but um uh in the older ages of evil land i want to take then and so that, that intensifies my interest intensifies my interest and after a series of dreams and things like that i now come to this place where i'm saying okay this is this is actually this is actually the truth right this is actually what's going on i begin incorporating it into my own life and i begin seeing major differences clarity and things like that um and then i just kept growing from there um so i have been growing with the channel but the thing that brought me there came from many different directions. Thank you so much for that. This is a highly uh, important um, 
a project, the one that they are working on, and because a lot of um, Africans and not only African diaspora at this time, because when you don't look at this case, you don't yet understand it. But when you begin to look at them, like you said, you, you begin to see them that each of them is actually connected. And when you start to look at also the, the, the um, I don't want to say the deficiency or the deficit that we have in terms of understanding our history, you see that that is, is deeply rooted. Yes. And the consequences also is deeply rooted because it affects everything we do. It affects the way we shape our society. And gradually, gradually, more and more people are losing track of their, of their, of their ancestral land, of where they are coming from, of right. the composition of the society, of what it means to be African, what it means to be from Africa. So in a time like this, it is very important that we have people who are coming out to look at it, to, to help the people to look at the same reality again. It's not, it's, not, it's not that it is presented, it's different from that. We need more eyes that are interested in understanding African history. Yeah. This is very important. Also because, like I, like I continuously say in this podcast, nobody is coming from anywhere to do this work for us. And this yes. work I'm referring to is tedious. It's very hard. It requires a lot of time. It requires also a lot of resources. We don't have the resources, but we do have the time. Yes. With, with the blessing of our ancestors, we'll be able to retrace our step. But it is a hard, hard job. All right. No. Yeah, one please of the go. Things too, one of the paradigm shifts I had around the time that I, that I was just before I started the channel is I came to realize that everybody has, you know, not realize, but, you know, the incorporate that as a fact, right, in my own life. That everybody has what our ancestors call a chi, right? And your chi brings you into the world for a specific purpose, right? And one of the ways to know what that purpose is are the things you complain about. If there is something about the world that you are constantly bothered by, right? If you're bothered by or you, that type of thing, you're actually supposed to be the person who addresses that thing. Unless you want to just go through the world and have this itch and nobody itching it and asking, why is nobody itching my neck? That kind of thing. Why is nobody itching my arm? That kind of thing. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this to say, um, to add on to what you said previously about how we are the ones who have to do this work. Right. Because many of us will say, oh, our language is dying. Our culture is dying. People are disconnecting this and this and that. But the people, a lot of the people saying these things have little traces of that thing in themselves. that They can share with others or they can work towards preserving or they can work towards advancing. Right. We see this a lot at home. You know, OK, the government's not doing this. The government's not doing that. OK, fine. The government's never going to do it. Right. But it bothers you. So maybe you're the one who's supposed to do the thing. Right. And I think one of the things we often do is we um, intimidate ourselves. Um, we intimidate ourselves without reason. Right. So um, I call myself a researcher. I'm not backed by any university. I'm not, you know, that type of thing. I'm just a person with who has done the work in a very intense way. And anybody who has researched this topic can sit down with me and, um, you know, I'll, I can teach them something about it, right? That kind of thing. There's no, I'm, I'm, I didn't run away from that title, right? Because I didn't say, oh, okay, this is supposed to be in the hands of the professionals. There's nothing that, there's no uh, additional fingers that the professionals or the others have that I don't have, right? So I'm going to go ahead and do the work and present what I need to present and that kind of thing. Um, and this goes for as far as everything, as far as our culture goes. You know, a lot of, we know there's a problem. We know that there are many problems coming in many different directions. And the ones that itch us the most, it is us, we are the person who's supposed to do that thing. You know, um, we, the, one of the ways I refer to this is there's this infantilizing we do of ourselves, right? We do an infantilizing where we constantly believe there's supposed to be a parent that's going to fix any issue that bothers us. So we are. We then create a situation where we're proud to cry, or we're proud to complain, or we're proud to point out the issue. If I go online and I say this thing is bad, that's got done a good enough job. I've cried. The bottle is coming soon, right? Um, but what I came to learn is that those things that bother you, you're the one who's supposed to address them. Those things that you feel are wrong, and many of us know that our languages, languages, you know, are in danger. Many of us know that our culture is in danger. And I, 
my Igbo is my Igbo, my Igbo is not is not at any place I want it to be. Right, I'm constantly working on improving it. But if I, had I said, let me wait till somebody who speaks better Igbo starts this online school, it wouldn't be here. Because I started this not because I feel that I'm the expert on the language. It's because this is something I wanted to see in the world. That's something I wanted to have in the world when I was younger, so that I can go there and learn. You know, and so I said. You, you know what, what? What is even funny about it is that uh, just to add to what you're saying there, you know, because some people really do think that the expert are going to do the work. Yes. And what we come to understand that the expert are not really interested in doing the work because they have other thing that they want to do. Yes. So I come to believe that it is he who is ready to do the work that will really do it. You don't need to be expert to start it. Yes. You just need to really have the fire burning in you that you want to do it. Do it with the strength that you have, with the ability that you have, of course, with the intention to grow, learning to improve in it. Because if we are waiting for the expert, ah, okay, the university professors will do it, it will not be done. Because remember that what they are defending is not, might not necessarily be the city that you are defending. But if they happen to be the one to do it, it would have been better. But they are never going to do it because that is not their objective. Sometimes, not in all the cases, but sometimes. So I think all of us must ask ourselves where I am today, right now, with the capacity that I have. We did not know that I know what can I do at this moment. Yes. If you say, ah, okay, I'm not rich. You, you know, there are certain things that the rich people can do. That is for them. There are things that the poor people can do, if I want to use that word like that. There are those people that are flying in the, in the air. They don't do the thing that are those that are working on the ground can do. Yes. yes. But those flying in the air rely also on what those that are, fly, are working on the on the ground. So all of us have a role, have a stake in this. Yes, yes. It's interesting too because our ancestors say have this understanding of wisdom, right, as not belonging to an individual. So that when I receive wisdom, I'm receiving it from beyond myself, and I'm receiving it as a custodian of that wisdom, right, or an idea or an inspiration. Something from beyond me is giving it to me so that I can pass it on or make it happen, right? But a lot of people receive these inspirations, right, which come in the form of complaints or agitation or um, that kind of thing. And then they say, okay, but let me wait for somebody better than me to do this thing, right? That kind of thing. I waited, I'm 34 now, I waited 34 years for somebody to start Kenyu. They didn't do it. So I did it. I'm very happy that I did it. I'm very happy that I did, right? Um, because even if I don't have the money to build a school or even the expertise in, or not like to speaking the language, right? Or like I, I speak with a very strong legal accent, right? So even if I have all of these things, I have what it takes to assemble a team, right? Of, of, of teachers and folklorists and people who are really into this already and say, hey, this vision was given to me and you are a part of it and let's make this thing happen. And here we are, right? And you think, one of the ways I like to think about it is people did a lot in the world, let's call it 1940, the year 1940, human beings did a lot of wonderful things. This computer behind me, is 20 times the technology any of them had ever seen in their life. 20 times the connection, 20 times the access, right? If you want to look at it as a thing of wealth, that it's a thing of wealth that none of those people had. But they built railroads and planes and sailed around the world and did all these wonderful things, right? And so if I have this thing, what is stopping me from doing a quarter of what was done in the past by people who had significantly less, significantly less, you know? One of the things I look at too, because I can is going to grow and expand into a full university, right? And this is something that I always wanted to do. Uh, but one of the holdups for was, okay, I don't have the money, and this and this and that. But, you know, what is a university but an assembly of knowledge, an assembly of teaching, right? An assembly of expertise, that kind of thing. And when the first, when, you know, the first universities were being built, they didn't have this thing. 
that allowed them to do it in a very easy way, a very simple way, right? They didn't have that. So let me think about what I have. Let me use what I have, forget the old model and build a new model. Because when that inspiration was given to me from beyond myself, it factored my reality. And it said, no, you're supposed to do it in the way your reality says do it. So if I don't have <laughs> money, I'm supposed to do it in the no money way. There's an ilu or a proverb that says that when the chi of a blind man sends him into battle, it is already accounted for his blindness, right? <laughs> that is powerful. <laughs> right. You're going to go to that battle. You're going to win and you're going to win in the way a blind man will win. You being blind is a part of the design, that kind of thing, right? That's one of the ways you can interpret it, you know? And so I look at it that way. And I would love to, if anybody picks up anything from my channel or anything that I'm doing, uh, let it be that. Let it be that. Just go. Just do it. There's another <laughs> one that says the ram enters battle head first, right? <laughs> when, when the ram is fighting, it's coming at you head first. Just yeah, absolutely. Let, let, let's hit it. Because where, you, where your head is there, where, which part of your body is going to refuse the, the, the challenge yeah. now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is very easy to buy into the idea of, oh, I'm not intelligent. Ah, no, I'm not smart. Ah, no, I don't have the money. Ah, no, I don't know people. But I like what you said, though, that, you know, first, it's also very important that we understand the basic concept of life, that we need to ask ourselves, why are we even here to start with? Because some people just run around trying to follow other, what other girl would say, follow the follower, yeah. like the sheep. They see somebody going there, they just follow. Uh, what is happening? What is the train? They just follow. But you forgot that you are here on this earth. You are living for a purpose. What is your purpose? Because if you can find your purpose, it doesn't mean that you are not going to suffer anymore. The Canadian um, uh, clinical psychologist, um, uh, Peter, uh, Jordan Peterson, says that life is basically suffering. Let's, let's take this one in context. Knowing that you are going to, knowing that you have a mission, doesn't mean that you are not going to suffer. But the question is, what are you suffering for? Right. Right. Because if you don't know your mission, you are still going to suffer anyway. So it's better you just suffer for something, no? Yeah. So, there's, yeah, there's, yeah, please. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, 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 go. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. are here for you. <laughs> you know, bringing up the Peterson quotes, um, or no, the, something you said before that, actually. Um, I was even thinking of another ilu, uh, the world is each person in their chi, right? So that your experience in the world, what you are supposed to bring into the world or the space you're supposed to occupy in the world or what you're supposed to be is specific to you. Nobody else has that formula except your God. Nobody else has your formula. There's a thing and, you know, in while I'm very specific in studying the Igbo cosmology, if you, once you understand, once you begin with a pinpoint, any culture, just about the whole of West Africa into Central Africa, you'll see that we're all saying the same thing, right? And one of the things that we say that kind of differs from the Abrahamic account is the fact that an individual is born perfect, right? In the Abrahamic account, an individual is born flawed and is trying to find perfection, that kind of thing. And those little things create a shift in thinking a shift in thinking. Now, what do I mean by each person is born perfect? If you were born with one leg, you were supposed to have one leg, right? It's not a deformity. You were supposed to have one leg. That is how your chief said, go into the world and, and do X, Y, Z with that, your one leg, right? The, the, if you were born with one eye, if you were born short or tall, all of these things are, exist for a reason, right? That type of thing. Well, the Abrahamic account, it, it, one of the things it does to a society is it creates a situation where an individual may feel inadequate without crutches from X, X Y, Z or uh, elsewhere. Okay, I'm not good enough until I uh, do this, this, this and that and take this course and do this and then maybe then I might be good enough, right? That kind of thing, right? Whereas there's, um, you know, I research constantly. And I have a research library, like, for example, like my followers or uh, the people that follow me um, on uh, my YouTube channel can join my Patreon. And on my Patreon, I, I make my entire research library available. I make my entire research library available to them so they can read the things that I'm reading. If I say something that sounds like nonsense or BS, they can go and check and see if 
<laughs> if I'm telling the truth, right? And so one of the documents in there, it was a phenomenal document, and there was a woman who was a midwife. And somebody had asked her, the researcher had asked her, um, how did you learn to be a midwife? And what she said was, when I was a child, anytime midwifery was happening, I would come and watch. And from there, people said I was a midwife and included me in the process. And that goes back to that thing I was saying before about people, all, our ancestors already seeing the way you are as the way you're supposed to be, right? This, this, this person, when I'm doing this thing, this person comes here, okay, this person's already that thing. There was a, there's another thing in, a, in my culture um, where uh, it's called the Inze title. Take a title and in taking that title, you become a living ancestor. You become a living ancestor. And so I was speaking to the head of our Inze society, a uh, very old man, half in his 90s, um, but still very alert and sharp. And I was speaking to him and I asked him, Oh, is there like a training? Because there's a lot of rules that go with it, right? I was like, is there like a, do they train you or teach you or that kind of thing? He says, once you say you're an Inze, you're an Inze. That's the training, right? If you say it's inside of you, you declare it, it comes out, right? So all of these things speak back to that original thing I was speaking about, that you're already born the way you're supposed to be. If you have this vision of building airplanes, but you were born poor, you will build airplanes. Just trust that vision, right? Trust that, in that if it's true, if it's true inside of you. If it's not like, I want to build airplanes so I can then reach this point, and that kind of thing. If it's true inside of you, go for it. It's going to happen, right? That kind of thing. And that's that's the way our ancestors saw many of the things in our culture. And you'll see this from all that. I mean, I can go further, but I'll, these are the ones I know for sure. All the way from what we call Gambia to all the way we think, call Congo, we all say similar things like this. We all have this idea that the way you are born is the way you are supposed to be. If you want to know your purpose, you have to know your truth because it's already there. It's already written on you. Right? It's a full package and you are going to have to unveil it. You are going to have to, to find out so that you can have a meaningful life. Otherwise, you are just going to run around in this world and you are going to disappear the same way you came, like a mistake. Yes. But like, actually, it's not supposed to be a mistake. That is, that is a purpose why you are here. All right, now help me understand this. If you were to break down your work into uh, maybe a few buckets to help people better understand it, what would it be? Explain your project to me. Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, you know I'm currently working on two projects, but the one that you know um, my most my, my newest project is the uh, Igbo Language Academy at Kedu Domini. So the Igbo language is one of the languages that have this particular challenge of um, falling into recession. Less people are using it um, than the past and so forth. But at the same time, there's this resurgence in passion to learn the language, right? And so my initial goal was to build a physical school. I wanted to build a physical school where children can go and learn. And of course, didn't have the money, didn't have the resources, don't even know where to begin, that kind of thing. Um, but in the process of trying to learn or, or trying to build this thing, I did a lot of researching as to how language is acquired, right? So if I were to give it a unique or put in a unique description, right? It's a, it's a, um, it's an, it's, what's the word? It is an effective language, uh, uh, learning school. And I say effective uh, deliberately, because the way 99.9% .9 of language is taught in the academic structure is actually not how language is acquired, right? So to sum it up or sum up myself, I'm a researcher, right? And I apply that capacity to research to everything I do. So every single project I go into is going to have an a depth of that or a richness of that because that is what my chi gave me to offer in the world, right? So Kedu is, is, is a school, but it is not a school the way you think a school would happen, right? Um, one, of, one of the examples, for example, now, right, is that we have this idea, you know, a lot of people, especially those born in diaspora like myself, will say that my parents didn't teach me my language, right? Well, if you do the research and look into it, you'll actually learn that language not transition from parent to child. Language goes from peer to peer. So the big mistake we're making is thinking that parents are supposed to teach their children, but really we're our friends in these languages. That's actually how language transitions. That's why my accent doesn't sound like my father's accent. 
right? Most people are going to sound more like their friends and the people they grew up with or use the slang and inflections of their friends and the people they grew up with than that of their parents, right? And so, again, that, that's applying that capacity to research, right? I don't have a wealth of money. I don't, sometimes I don't have a wealth of time, but I have a wealth of this ability to figure things out. And I can apply that. That is, that is a wealth. I can exchange that for other things, you know, that kind of thing. So it, to sum me up as a person, I'm a researcher, right? I'm a researcher. And I apply that to my projects. Projects, the, the one, that, the, the newest project is Keru.me, right? The Igbo Language School. And I say it's an effective Igbo Language School because we use the method that research has revealed to be most effective in transitioning language. So instead of us having a, a learn the alphabet, do this, do that, we pair you with two different people. You have your instructor where you go uh, together and you learn with peers, right? You're learning with other people that are trying to learn um, that type of thing. So it looks more like a classroom setting. Um, you take a piece of the language and you break it down and you move on, that kind of thing, right? Take another, break it down, move on. And then you have a coach and this is somebody at home that will reach out to you and call you and you guys just have conversations the way you would with your friends. Anything you want to talk about. I had a student that says that, you know, I, before they start, I, I asked them a little bit about themselves, things like that. She says, honestly, what I like to do is uh, smoke, eat, and wash it. So her coach should be talking to her about that, you know, that kind of thing. And, and from there, you see the language coming out a lot faster because now I'm comfortable. Now the thing that I'm interested in is the topic. Now I'm learning the words that are relevant to me. And then all of a sudden, the, 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 the growth in that language moves a lot faster. Um, and then the medicine shell is the second project. I don't see them as separate projects, by the way, right? But the medicine shell is the second project. The medicine shell is me teaching our ancestral cosmology, history, um, and way of life, right? Or a way of seeing things, right? Um, I couldn't tell you why I'm doing it. The, the, the why doesn't matter I, either way. It's a compulsion. I must do it. Something is pushing me to do it that I don't understand, but I'm going to do it, right? And from there, people go, um, uh, I'll take concepts like the chi, uh, all these different topics, um, and I'll explain them in a way um, after like, you know, speaking to these people, different people and researching that kind of thing, I'll explain them in a way that gives clarity on the subject for anybody that's listening, right? So you don't necessarily have to be um, of the culture to understand what I'm discussing or how I'm breaking it down or the meaning of it. And then one of the things that a lot of my um, patrons and subscribers do is they'll then show me parallels in other cultures. And I try not to do that in my videos because I believe some things need to be spoken about in isolation before they're compared to other things. So I'll, I'll just speak about it as it is. And then people will tell me, okay, well, did you know that your ancestors were saying four wolves breaks down in four ages? Ugaka, Ugang, and um, Ati. Did you know that the Indians have a system called the Yugas? which are four ages, right? I'm not, I don't know them by mind, but there's one Yuga, you, you got something, you got something, you got something, you got something. They'll be showing me all these parallels around the world and you come to find that we as human beings are not as different as we previously thought we were, you know? So yeah, to sum it up, I'm a researcher. I apply that into anything I do and then different results. That is a, a, a deep thought and it is very important. We need to approach it sometime also like that, that we are not alone, even uh, body the universe and in this world, no? <laughs> I come from uh, a people that is called Esa. Now, if you go to Japan, the same way that Esa is written, which is E-S-A-N, you also find it there. I have not done the research yet to find out what, because, but I have opened up this uh, podcast in my language too. I am right. provoking the same question. Let's talk about it. What is this? What is our culture? Where are we coming from? What do we know? What do we don't know? How, because whether you know it or you don't know it, it affects you anyway. Because if it is a structure, it has been set up, and you are part of it, it is going to affect you. Yes. Ignorance yes. is not is not going to be an excuse. Right. right. So it is important that we know about our culture, our origin, where we are coming from. Uh, the idea that it is then that we do it, I think we need to remove it from our mind. It is us that we do it.
Yes, 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 yes. So each of us start must start looking for what can you do? You that is looking, you that is talking, you that is complaining. What are you doing to change the situation? Because you might be the little light, the little candle that is required to shine in the dark. Yeah. So I think we must be looking at us as my responsibility to change the situation. All right. Now, you see, there is a wealth of knowledge in Africa. I'm continuing still talking to different people in Africa, both people like you that are young, that are really motivated, that are doing all sorts of things from science, innovation, businesses, culture. Africa is basically waking up. Don't waking up with, uh, with the idea of coming to beg, but waking up first with understanding who you are. You see, it takes the Europeans several centuries, several centuries to break down Africa into pieces. That is still where we are today, basically in pieces. Right, you're 100% so, right. So if we think that we are just going to remake Africa in 100 years, we are lying to ourselves. Right. If it takes them one, several hundreds of years to do this, it's going to take us several hundreds of years to be able to put the pieces together because we are going to know what is even the significance of the little thing that is part of us? So, talking of this knowledge that is available both in Africa and among Africans, how do you approach your research? How do you get tap into this knowledge? Help me with that. Very good question. So, very, very good question because it has changed radically. Sometimes one of the deficits or the things you suffer from as a researcher is that you'll be so locked into the concepts that you don't get time to sit down and incorporate them or really, you know, spend time with them in like a leisurely way, right? But every now and then when I get some time to think to myself, every time I walk out of it and my, life, my approach or my life changes radically, right? And so the reason I say this is because my initial research process, I had a rule. If I can't confirm something in two places, I'm not going to say it. I cannot confirm it in two places. So what I'll do is um, on my channel, I'll, I'll make a video. And in the video, I'll say, if you guys want to hear about this, let me know. When I mention these topics, I'm talking, you know. If you want to hear about this, let me know. And then people will comment, right? I take the comments. We move it to Patreon, right? The Patreon.com slash The Medicine Show, by the way, if anybody's interested. And the patrons will vote on which ones they want to see from all the comments. Now, then the process begins. Um, I'll go into my library. I will see what research has been done on the topic already. There's no documents uh, imaginable that I don't have in there, right? If I don't have them, I have people all the time that send me more, and that's I'm super grateful for them. So the first thing I'm going to do is see what has been said in the academic sense about the or the topic, about the topic. After seeing what was said in the academic sense. I'll reach out to individuals who are in position of knowing, right? So a lot of my topics would require would be enhanced by speaking to a devia, right? But some topics will be enhanced by speaking to an elder. Some topics would be enhanced by speaking to somebody who's a member of the masquerade society that, that preserves the knowledge, um, that kind of thing. So I identify the people I need to speak to, to that kind of thing. And again, anything I'm seeing, two of them have to cross it or say it for me to go ahead and present it and so forth. Now, that was my previous process. Now, in the process of this, I come to learn that our ancestors did not see learning as something or knowledge as something somebody passes on to another person, but rather something that comes out of an individual, right? It comes out of you, unless it is a knowledge you receive from the universe itself, but it, it comes out of you, that type of thing. And so then, I, you know, I left that alone. But as I'm doing my research, I'm learning that my, what I have realized or what I know has surpassed what my research is able to deduce. And it's not to say that I know more than the people that I'm speaking to. That is absolutely not the case, right? Or I know more than the people. I found where this knowledge lives, which is inside in a very unique way. And I'm able to see it everywhere and pull it out everywhere. So, but I made an initial rule of keeping my own deductions to myself. But there are some things I'll say now that, <laughs> that I can say that 
we <laughs> change a lot of things in different places, right? Uh, one of the um, examples was um, when I was researching the topic of the Osu system, the Osu system, which is often called the Osu cat system, right? We found that a lot of the research was inadequate because there's a thing that people do when they're in academics, especially in Africa, they begin feeling superior to the regular person. Whereas when it comes to culture and history, the people who know the most are not necessarily the people who came out of the school, because that's not where that's kept. You understand? Know what, the, the, what we call the school system is mimicking the European system. So Europeans are not interested in in, uh, in any way. If they have to, they'll do it grudgingly and angry. Don't call that. They'll leave. That kind of thing. Right? So um, as I'm speaking to the people on the ground about this thing, I come to find that there are things that in the academic space is not known about this system whatsoever. I begin seeing the link to places that you wouldn't imagine, right? That you would not imagine. That Genghis Khan sacking bad had a direct effect on us in Africa in a very radical way, right? You spoke about Ishan earlier, right? Ishan, uh, Bini, Ipo, all the Igala, that area was radically impacted by that event. You understand? And none of the research had that. And then I keep going in further and further in, into myself and into the research as well. And I'm drawing different conclusions and things like that. So um, my research process was very specific before, but now it has become a lot more intuitive. It has become a lot more intuitive. I'm able to see the patterns um, immediately. And I came to learn that what before seemed like it would need a complicated process is actually right there. We spoke, you spoke earlier about, you know, the Japanese also having this, this word. Right, the Ishan, or what it's so what you're Ishan. Yeah, yeah. Ishan. Uh -huh. Yes, Ishan. And I'm, I'm like, okay, and you look at it, you go, okay, what, what is that? You're, you're curious about it. So, this is what I came to find. All of all ancient people are doing the same thing as modern people, and that they are trying to explain the world around them. And so, if I'm standing in Japan and I'm describing the sky, and I'm standing in, uh, let's say, Abeokuta, uh, and I'm describing the sky, we're going to say very similar things, right? And that it's not a matter of, oh, let me figure out what the Japanese ideas are. These, these are not their ideas. Let me go figure out what the Igbo ideas are. These are not their ideas. These are different ways of describing these phenomena of living that we're all encountering. And once you realize that, the research process actually becomes very easy, very quick, and very intuitive. So... This is very interesting. You see, uh, I think the people in the ancient, um, they have this way of tapping into this knowledge that even helped them to do some extraordinary thing that sometimes we are still trying to figure out even today, 2022. You see, the construction of Egypt is still, a, is still, is still surprising people how they managed to build this pyramid. It's all about knowledge. I think uh, the, uh, the modern world is trapped by the idea of uniformity, of thinking that everything must be, uh, must pass through one process. I think what this one actually does is that it limits a lot of things, a lot of information that we needed to have. Yes. Because now human beings are no longer organic. We need to fit in into a small square. Knowledge. It's not only one thing. I think it's like a circumference of 360 degree. Yes. Now, you coming to tell me that this is the only way to see it. Of course, your way of seeing it might actually be a good way of seeing it. But that is not the only way to see it. You can see it from 360 degree. Each one counted one, two, three to 360 degree angle. Because if we are seeing it like this, it will be difficult for people to be bored. Because everybody has something to do. Everybody has a role to play in the discovering of this knowledge and since we are at a deficit in it in africa able to understand our knowledge and because you have a lot of people coming to patronize what you do what do you want to say concerning the the urge in the people i mean the young african diaspora try to understand themselves yeah. do you think the fire is actually burning is dead enough to find out who they are what do you want to say about that? There is something happening. 
right? There's something happening. And like I said, in my previous way of thinking, when I was younger, you wouldn't be able to explain it. And when the history of this era is written, they'll try to explain it, but it won't completely fit if we're using the same mold of explaining things, right? Um, if we're trying to see things, like you said, put everything in a box or see things in a very linear way. There is something very profound happening with Africans all over the world where they're at once, everybody just pivoted in a specific direction. And that is the pursuit of our truth. Now, everybody has their different way of doing it. Some people, the two people could be doing it in ways that seem opposed to each other. And each of them think that the other one's not doing the right thing, that kind of thing. But at the same time, everybody pivoted, right? As I was doing this channel, I've been approached by three people now. I think the number is three. And they'll say, hey, I had this dream. Is this in Sibidi? And Sibidi is a language that our ancestors uh, throughout the region used to write with. And they would still send me a sign. They'll say, hey, I got I had a dream. An old woman came, drew this sign on sand for me. Is this a sign of something? Or is this in Sibidi? And I'll say, it doesn't look like any in Sibidi I know, but it's very interesting. Then another person will come. The exact same story. I had this dream. A woman came to me in a dream. She drew a, sli- a sign in the sand and she said, uh, you know, that this is my sign. She says, this is my sign, right? That kind of thing. So if you want to look at it on that level, something's happening. But there's also another level you can look at it, the level that most people can understand is that a lot of people are pivoting in this direction at the same time, right? What I would have to say is there is a reason this is happening and keep going, keep going. Because I don't know the reason. I'm not supposed to know the reason. I'm not the one who's going to pull the reason out. But I know the same thing that made people start looking in the direction of my channel is the same thing that made me start looking in the direction of doing that channel. And it's something I can't explain. It's something that you cannot uh, put in a linear box and say, this is why it happened. Now, again, when they go back and write the history, they'll, they'll, put, it, they'll put something to it. And they'll say that's what happened. Now, but I know there's things beyond it that are happening, which is why... Right. I say that as I was researching, I came to or one of the things that brought me to my research was seeing that the way things are explained are not really how they happened. And that, that's only a piece of the story and that there's an under if you want to call it under or over right layer that when you put the two together, you see an entirely different picture. And it comes from or comes closer to that 360 that you were speaking of. Um, than if you were to just say this is how this is da, 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 da. so i can't tell you why everybody is looking in this direction right because everybody at the same time is deciding to question what they were taught and pursue their very specific truth their very specific truth i don't know why it's happening but i know it's profound and i think everybody who is um who watches my channel or interested or you know pursues in their own different way keep going Keep going. There's something building. There's something building. I love that. There is something building. I believe I can feel it. I can feel it, my brother. I can feel it. Because when so many people like this are having uh, this thought, this refusal of the status quo that I've been, which have not led us to the right place, which has kept us where we are, it means something is in the making. And I think yes. as Africans, we have a chance to be able to rewrite our history the way that we want it. Not because we want to make favor to someone else. And to do this, of course, all of us are going to have the chance to find this knowledge, to seek for it, not only in the way, in the first square that this is the only way you have to go. No, that is not the only way you have to go. You can go this way. The north is established by some people who, according to them, it makes sense. But if we turn the north pole to another side, then it might not make sense to them. So they, it's not in their interest to do that. Right. So it depends on who is telling the story and for whom. So I think in this sense, African people need to make a... Um, I don't say... We, we need to make a choice. No doubt about that. And we need to be able to pursue our own truth according to how it reflects us. Yes. So like you said, keep going. If you feel it, keep going. Now, let's talk about something that I found very important in the course of your explanation, which is spirituality. Mm-hmm. Tell me something about the Igbo spirituality. I see that you are trying to, you cover that a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
So um, there's a lot to be said. If there wasn't, I wouldn't have much of a channel, right? But there's a lot to be said. There's something in what you said that actually adds on to uh, my own answer, right? And it's that each person is going to explain things their own way. So that, no, no, why do I say this? So one of the things that's fascinating about ego spirituality is you'll find that whatever it is you think that our ancestors, and when I say our, I mean Africa, right? But I'm going to begin from the one I know. Um, so when I say, yeah, so our ancestors, oh, they didn't have, they didn't have that. Just, just, just wait, right? <laughs> you will now come to find that they had that, but they had it in their own very specific way. So in looking into the spirituality, I'm growing as a person. I'm feeling it. I feel my own growth as a person, but I'm also growing as what I was to begin with, which was a history fan, a fan of history, um, um, uh, someone who just is obsessed with learning about the events of the past and so forth. One of the things you come to learn is that as African people, and um, let me say Igbo specifically, the, as far as Igbo culture goes, there were no separations between this is government, this is spirituality, this is uh, uh, church time, this is non-church time. Things were not done. That. Everything lived together in this big organic space, right? If you look at the way we cook our soups um, at home, right, everything goes into the pot. Everything goes into one place. You come to the West and then, you know, your carrots are over here and the meat is over here. And it's also, it's a different way of thinking, right? But us... Hey, hold, hold it there, hold it there. You're going to continue yeah. from there. <laughs> what about medicine? I know we're going to come yeah. to that. Even yeah. the way that we treat also our body is not the eyes or the head. It's the whole of the body. The whole and the so i'm coming to you please go on this your explanation yeah, yeah. make a lot of sense so we the way in in if you want to learn um, the way um, or what i've been able to learn you have to realize that we do things differently so i get to say Igbo spirituality right but that actually means i get to cover every single thing imaginable because it was not separated from the spiritual right eating is spiritual walking is spiritual you know, footpaths are spiritual, uh, just like a, a road. There's, there's, it wasn't a matter of this is the spirituality and we're going to do it on Sunday. Then you go do whatever you come back and do spirituality on Sunday, right? You don't do spirituality. It's in everything. It's a, it's not a matter of saying this tree is spiritual. It's a matter of saying what is the spirit of this tree. What is the spirit of this space right here? What is the spirit of looking at a vacuum cleaner, this vacuum cleaner, that kind of thing? And grad, just understanding the world from this space where things are not as delineated and pieced to get pieced apart and, and so forth. Your example is perfect, medicine, right? When you go, when you heal in the traditional way, you don't just take something and walk away. You're also going to be prescribed lifestyle changes, right? Take this on this specific day. Right, you're going to take this on Eke Day, you're going to take this on Uriya Day, and I'll use an example. So, in my research library, that's you know, that I make available to my patrons, there's a story of a woman who goes to Adibia and she is having a hard time having children. So, he gives her medicine, right, that would um, enhance her fertility, of course, but then she recommends that she needs to sacrifice um i think a goat i could be could be goat or chicken one of them sacrifice a goat and prepare a feast for the children of that community and when the children come to eat entertain them right entertain them so what is he doing there is an issue with her her fertility and it resonates on a physical level and a spiritual level and the entertaining and the feeding of children went hand in hand in her solution because there was no separation between them. The body was not a separate thing from the spirit. You know, if I break my elbow, my entire arm is going to have a different, is going to move differently. If I put on a cast, my entire arm is going to move differently, that kind of thing. But we take it even further that if you are not able to have children, look in the spiritual space and then look in the physical space and what you will ultimately end up doing is walking with those two legs in order to find your solution right so that's a perfect example now i get to talk about medicine and science and healing but i'm actually talking about spirituality you know <laughs> that kind of thing so
it's very interesting, you know. It's very interesting. And we must keep talking about it. If you find value in what you do, you must keep talking about it. You must keep doing it. I find a lot of value doing this about us, about where we are coming from. So that is why I keep doing it. Now, you were talking about Ekede. Um, uh, um, okay, some of the days that you were make, make, making mention in there. Now, in my place, in ESA, we have basically five, our week is five days. Okay. At these five days, we have Edugbo, which is the day for, the, you can go to the farm every other day, but that is a particular day of farm. But okay. I call, that is the day we call Edugbo. Edeki. You can do market every other day, little market, but in the day, there is a day they do the bay market in Urumi, for example. So, we, uh, okay, I'm, refer, I'm referring to our part of Insana, Urumi, no? I mean, okay, if you want to put it like that, the specific village where I'm coming from. So, we have the day that you go to the market, which is Edekuli. Edeze. This, this day, you can still do every other day, but you don't go to farm. If you are a woman who has lost the husband, you are not supposed to go to farm. Then we, uh, there are a lot of explanations to be done there. We, we might not know to go in detail. I'm actually bringing this up. So I want to ask you if there is something similar there because you did make mention of days, no? Then we have the day to go to, um, go to the, the small market. We have the day to relax. Get it? Now. So if you look at the week now set up, you see that it was life was supposed to be balanced actually yeah. but that day they say you shouldn't go to the farm you're supposed to rest no mm -hmm. so now we are bringing spirituality into it we are bringing a little bit of market a little bit of food a little bit of dancing everything actually is together there is no separate in it Oops. so uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah please yeah go oh no, yeah it's exactly like you said so we have ak orie afo mpo right this is the four they call them the four market days or more on all the four spirits right so the reason these days have their different rules is because each of these days is a specific um eu right which means a universal stream it's it's a door right so a different aspect of the universe opens itself on each day right what is the example um, my next video I'm actually releasing is on the four market day. So this is very apt. Um, I'll be releasing, I think, well, anyways, I don't know when you put this out, so I won't say any dates, but it's, it's going to be the next one. So um, one of the things that's interesting, too, is that like AK day, on AK day, you don't go to the farm, like you said. You don't enter a bush. You cannot enter a forest on AK day. Um, you don't really do work. It's a day of rest. You know, that kind of thing. It's a, de a day of relaxation. That is the nature of that specific day. You know, the next day is Uriye Day. Uriye is associated with water. Uh, Uriye is associated with the Western direction, the direction West, right? Now, on Uriye Day, there's going to be, like you said with your community, there's going to be a, a community that has the Uriye market. And that is the only market that's allowed to be open. The Eke and Gua, the all the markets will close, but Uriye market will be open. You understand? On Afo day, the third day, the Afo market opens, the other markets close. On Kwa day, the Kwa market opens, the other markets close. And it creates this cycle where all of the communities in the area need each other. They're intermixed with each other. They can't, they, 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 they become one or united with each other and that kind of thing. And it creates, like you said, balance so that wealth doesn't hemorrhage this is one of the original designs that prevented wealth from hemorrhaging in one place and not another right in in you know if, if you look at like what's one of the issues they suffer with in the west right now is that how do we deal with the issue of urban sprawl right what's urban sprawl all of the value in town is concentrated in the middle and everything pans out from there and becomes a little bit less um whatever you know uh, uh useful and because it's less useful we have to keep more and more and more and then the towns end up being built in a very specific way that people are now trying to rethink how can we redo this thing and prevent issues with sprawl um and so forth because sprawl comes with a whole lot of issues but one of the issues it comes from is that there's a hemorrhaging of wealth in one place and so then there's a major wealth imbalance somebody that is from lagos should be should be listening to what you're saying because that is one of the problems that we're having in nigeria that all the facilities are put in one place now people are asking why are many nigeria coming to lagos 
you yeah. should have think no look at this they are not crazy yeah. if if we find a solution to what they are coming to look for in their places they will stay in their places it's not that they are crazy it's not right. because the, the way the society is structured yeah. society telling them hey all of you go to lagos go to lagos no right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> all right yeah because we are talking about spirituality and you did make mention of the masquerade and you like masquerade i want you to tell me uh, what is the connection between masquerade and spirituality? Actually, what is the role of masquerade in Igbo spirituality? Wonderful. Oh, man, with that, that it would be uh, two or three podcasts long if I were to explain the whole thing, but I can give you some interesting things here and there. So we have this concept in the modern day where we say, oh, that Africans didn't write down their history. Africa didn't write down their history. Um, absolutely not true. But we did it in a very different way than what you, somebody who would be saying that, would be used to, right? So one of, not this is not the whole role, but one of the roles of the masquerades is an account of history. It's an account of history, right? Why do I say this? There is a very specific way a masquerade is supposed to look. There's a specific way it's going to dance. There's a specific time of the year it comes out. There's a specific direction it walks, right? And there's specific rules that go around this particular masquerade. You understand? So there are some masquerades you will look at, right? And you you think, okay, I'm seeing somebody just being creative and putting things together, you know, putting on a show. Look closely, right? So you look at the masquerade and all of a sudden you're like, wait, he looks like he's camel, he's wearing camouflage for a forest. This looks like somebody who's wearing camouflage for a forest. Wait, this person looks like a traveler. If you look at it, it looks like a traveler. I'm going to use an example. A good friend of mine pointed this out. I wasn't even going to point it out. In my community, we have a masquerade called Okurusha, right? Okurusha is the one of the main masquerades of the area. And um, in fact, my community is kind of famous for it. And one thing you'll notice about the Okurusha is the Okurusha is all black. And it's wearing a skirt of raffia, and it has a hat like a like a hair like raffia, oh, like hair, almost like uh, that kind of thing. And Okorosha in the past was very fierce, right? If you disrespect Okorosha, it could it could kill you, or it can assault you, that kind of thing, right? It was a very fierce masquerade. People feared it. It, it was become a little kinder now, and so forth. Um, but um, me and my friend were talking about how the masquerades are actually, if you look at it, it's an account of history, right? Now, look at what the Okorosha does. The Okorosha comes out on Uriye Day, right? When it comes out, it walks a specific path. And then when it's leaving, it begins to say, um, or the community is now supposed to refer to it as Isu. And we use the term Isualala. Isualala leaves on Uriye Day. Isualala, that kind of thing, which means Isu is leaving. Isu is leaving. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Now, if you look at my community, it, the Oriya market is pointing towards a community known as Isu in central Igbo land. And if you look at that masquerade, what my friend pointed out to me was that this masquerade seems to have some connection to water. Oriya is connected to water. And the masquerade is wearing water gourds, several things that you would wear if you were traveling, if you were a traveler, right? And then it goes to a specific place, and we call it Isu. Isu is going home. Isu is going home. Now, what I know about Okorosha is Okorosha is supposed to represent our original ancestors in that land. So this display, what is it saying? That my people, based on this masquerade, came from this Isu place and settled on this place. Perhaps on Oriede, not sure. Set, settled, but settled, they came through water. And there's a river that you can follow called Njaba that leads you directly to Isu. You understand? There are masquerades. There's a masquerade in Gabon. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's said to come from the north. They say it comes, it moves north to south. You understand? And it is holding a branch of um, ogurishi, a, a plant called ogurishi. If you move further into that north they were talking about, into Cameroon, they also have the same masquerade or a similar one holding the same stick of ogurishi. If you move into what, um, what we now call the Cross River area, immediately after Cameroon, they have the same one it is, that is holding this same plant, right? That type of thing. What is that telling me? So I go and research what is Ogreishi used for. 
or no, I'm sorry, it's not Ogurishi. The the plant. I'm trying to remember the name of the plant. I don't remember it right now, but the, the specific plant it was holding. That specific plant is an anti-malarial medicine, right? And the story I'm seeing is that a group of people move from north to south holding this medicine because when you move down lines of latitude. It's very difficult to do historically because then your um, the diseases and the illnesses in the different places change on going up and down. Go side to side, you're fine. So most human migration is side to side, but the Bantu migration is unique because it went from north to south. In theory, it went north to south, right? That masquerade matched the accounts of what we're now calling the Bantu migration, and it gave you a little more insight. Right, because the masquerades always have something on their forehead and the same bushel of leaves of medicine. Right, so it told me that we were able to make this up and down movement, right, north to south movement that is unique in history by use of this anti malarial medicine. That's what I saw in that masquerade. So, masquerades are extremely powerful because they tell you the story. Our ancestors often recorded things the way we record them today, which is in action, in film. Let's call it film. Let's call it television. Let's call it uh, um, the Obehi podcast, right? We're physically seeing these things enacted. You know, if I go to watch uh, 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 a reenactment of um, uh, Nelson Mandela, that is a recorded history. It's a recording of the events. If I watch the Invictus movie um, that has Mandela, or if I watch a movie about Martin Luther King, I'm, it's the same thing as reading it on physical pieces of paper, right? And so the masquerades function in many different ways, but one of the ways that were particularly stuck out to me as a nerd for history is the fact that they are walking museums and they are films. So when you see a masquerade, pay attention to what it's wearing Pay attention to how it behaves, the day it comes out, where it goes, and what it's holding, and you'll then see something. You'll now see that, okay, <laughs> our ancestors were doing something, right? That kind of thing. <laughs> you see, this is a very important conversation. It is very, very important. Thank you. you see, in my village, I come from uh, Urumi. Uh, my village in Urumi, actually my my quarter, because there are several villages in Amedo, it's called Amedo Kian, but in Amedo Kian, there are several quarters. So, um, near my place, there is um, a masquerade that we call Ugbodomudu. Let me explain to you first, because it might sound very big, the, the name, no? I'm smiling because I think I know, I, I'm pretty sure it's one of my favorites on earth. I love it. <laughs> what you? Ah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, discovers this masquerade, you know, <laughs> it'll be global. But go ahead, man. Go. Okay. So this masquerade is feared. Okay, first of all, the name Ubodomondu. It would mean that the killer of the big heart. That is okay. the big heart in this sense that when you say you are you are the biggest, you are the toughest. Maybe for example, you are an evil person, you say you can kill any person, they wait for this masquerade because it's going to it's going to kill you. So what it basically means is that when this when there is something that is too tough for people to resolve, a too a riddle that is too tough, maybe there is a thief or any person that is too wicked that is, that terrorizes the community and is brought before this masquerade, you are supposed to tell the truth because if you lie, you are going to die. Now this masquerade usually comes out once in a while. You near you don't see it often. In our place, masquerade is a dance that we do almost like, uh, I think, every 14 days, every 7 days, more like, no, at a time. Of course, everybody wanted to see the masquerade, no, because it, the form, because there is the masquerade that dance with the people, the women running up. It's, it's a lot of fun. You can't even describe it. I tried to describe it in one of my books, talking about this masquerade, and of course, a lot of people like it for that. So, what I'm Try to drive out. Okay, now one of the reasons why this masquerade will come out is that either there is something that is affecting the community, and the elders of all the elders in the village of Amedokia, they are meeting in Okogole. Okogole is where the elderly people usually meet. Maybe say for example, the time that the rain is supposed to fall, the rain doesn't fall, and there is a suspect that maybe something is responsible for that. 
Maybe evil people might be responsible for that, for example. This is also how I describe it in my book. Mm. Then there will, there will be the gathering of the, all the people in the middle here, in Okogele. Now this masquerade will come out. And when it come out, it's going to make a pronouncement that whoever is holding, if, it, if somebody is holding the raid, that why he didn't fall for any reason, but talking of African spirituality now, okay? It will make a pronouncement that they must release the rain. As history has it, that day, rain will fall. Yeah. No month from that day, yeah. that night, that is how it happened. I cannot explain, I cannot explain it, but that is how it happened. Yeah. So, talking of masquerade, talking of the history, talking of the culture, the spirituality of the people. Yeah. Do you have something? I don't know. Maybe I don't know whether to say similar or or things like this. Also, among your people, I don't know what what, what, you, what you want to add to that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Um, <laughs> that's why I was one of, these, one of the reasons I was saying that if it's discovered by the world, it'll go global because ah, the thing works. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the um, um, I mean, yeah, yes. The, the the short answer is yes. Uh, there's a, I, one of my videos too. I talk about. I, I did a, a video talking about deviates, where I'm explaining, you know, what a devia is and everything that goes into the idea of becoming a devia. And um, like, for example, if a person feels that they have some type of spiritual calling, um, how did our ancestors approach this 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 calling or this thing? Because there's a lot of people today. I they I talk to them all the time that have the exact same thing our ancestors were describing. Like, no, the thing you said in the video is 100% what's happening to me. In fact, this, 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 and that. Yeah, so I made this video specifically for them, uh, but for everybody, of course. And in this video, I told the story, and you can even go watch this on uh, BBC. It's on BBC. You know, they had this young, you know, researcher, you know, who was going to go and prove if rainmakers were real back home, right? I think, I can't remember which one of the BBC subsidiaries it was, and he goes there and meets this old man, and you know, you see the man's face, you know this guy that is he's no he's not playing. <laughs> you understand? That he has made this happen more than a thousand times in his very long life, and you, you just see it in his face, you understand? Like, he was just... And so, the, um, the, the guy says, okay, well, they say you're able to make rain, da 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 you know, he's doing his thing, and there's a little sarcasm in how he's talking, and the, 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 the Divya then begins his work, right, uh, Divya, Igwe, Sky Divya, right, he then begins his work, right, and next thing you know, it starts raining right there on camera, right there, right there, you understand, and, you know, I get the sense that the reporter was disappointed, <laughs> <laughs> Bunk something, and he went there and the thing debunked him. And so the young man then goes, um, "Oh well, I checked my forecast, and uh, it says it was going to rain anyway." And then it's okay. Then why did you choose that day? Come back on in dry season and talk to this man. You'll see what happens. So again, one of the things about our spirituality is that it is not a matter of what somebody believes. These things are something somebody has made happen. And the reason I say that is because there's a belief that we have our rishi in our place, right? We have like a shrine in our place. If you go to a shrine and the, you, it, it, the person who is holding the shrine or who's working there says that this shrine could do this, 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 and that, and that thing doesn't happen, you stop going. And the community stops going. If that thing doesn't, if, 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 if you claim you can do this thing, it stops going. There's no obligation to believe in a rainmaker. That's why there's several. There's no obligation to believe in a devia. That's why there's several. And the ones that you find people going to again and again and again are the ones that said, I'm going to go to this devia because I want to do this. And they go and the thing happens. So it's proof of concept. The things that have that are that are still being patronized, especially the ones that are patronized actively, have already proven themselves as a concept. Just like with this rainmaker and that type of thing, the community knew why they took him to that man. He's done that thing several times, right? It wasn't that he um, went somewhere and got a certification, and now you're supposed to just believe him and, and that kind of. No, he's he he, he, he is that thing because he has done that thing, right? And that's what you find all over Africa, 
all over. Trust me, before I used to be like, ah, oh, this is nonsense, you know. It, it, me in, let's call it 2013, would not believe where I'm at right now, right? And you would say, oh, that's not really that kind of thing. But these things have proven themselves. The ones that don't prove themselves, we drop and we move. We drop and we move. So, yeah, it, it just kind of goes with that. Go ahead, though. <laughs> you see, I, I think that we African. Anyway, I think why we are so free is because we have abandoned ourselves. Yeah. And by law of nature, we are supposed to suffer until we recover ourselves. We first of all need to know who we are, where we are in this world. Because if our ancestors allow us to assess all the benefits that we are supposed to assess after we have abandoned them, it will not be right. right. Until we come back to our root embrace who we really are as a people instead of pretending to be european to be western yeah. we're supposed to suffer it is legitimate for africans to suffer the only remedy is for us to go back to our origin know who we are we must fight for our place in this world of course by fighting i'm not literally saying that we need maybe need to take up arm um, but if that is what it takes okay we can go for it but what I'm saying is that we must be bold enough to stand on our feet as African, embrace our spirituality, our humanity, our biology, our physiognomy, everything that makes us African, we must embrace it. And when we do that, there is nothing, not even the European can stop us. I believe this 100%. But we cannot stop we cannot fight any person in this world. We don't know who we are. I believe that there are these knowledge. You know, knowledge is power. Okay, knowledge, the, the application of power. There are these powers in Africa that we think they don't work. I want to give you an instance. In the city where I am, which is Verona, there is a, a museum here. This museum is owned by a missionary, uh, the Catholic uh, missionary. And inside this museum, there are lots and lots of artifacts coming from Africa. Of course. Of course. Okay. These are missionaries. Yeah. And they have told the African people that these things are evil. Mm -hmm. Why do you bring it to your home if they are evil? Are you not supposed to conquer the evil? Right. Why do you bring it to your home? Right. I'm not even talking of the British Museum, the American Metropolitan Museum, British uh, uh um uh, france why did they do this to us because they are trying from day one to detach us from who we are yeah. because if we know who you are nothing can stop you knowledge really is power yes yes one of the things we have to remember is that the pr one of the primary goals in the colonial experiment was to create customers. Britain was overproducing, right? And it needed customers. And what was it overproducing? It was overproducing clothing, things like that. So in order for me to make customers, because again, I'm making the thing that makes sense to my people, I can try to make the thing that belongs to other people, or I can go to those other people and find a way for them to hate the thing that they're wearing and feel value wearing the thing that I'm wearing. Now I have customers. And that's just, even today, if you watch a lot of commercials in the US, I know that where you're at, uh, the companies are probably there, they have laws against <laughs> doing nonsense like this, but in America, it's, it's, you know, it's wild here. So um, one of the things you'll see is the commercial will begin and it'll begin, uh, are, you, are you feeling tired in the morning? Are you feeling tired at night? Are you feeling this? It'll first convince you that there's something wrong with you, especially medicine commercials. They'll first convince you there's something wrong and they'll describe things that are just normal. Everybody feels. Do you, do you need coffee when you, you, you wake up? All these things. If you have all these things, you may be suffering from this and this and that. And in order for you to stop suffering from this and this and that, you need to come to this thing and, and then buy this thing and eat this thing. That kind of thing. Is your hair, look at my hair here. Is your, are you 60 years old and you're starting to have gray hair? You understand? <laughs> you understand? It's a small version of what they did all over the world. 
is to devalue everything everybody else has. Everything everybody else has. And then you all come to me and I sell it to you at any price I want to sell it. At any price I want to sell it. Till this day, Europe is not known as a place that sells cheap objects. They don't make things that uh, a Gucci or Versace shirt is not different from the, what they're printing up in the Vietnamese and Chinese and even African bills and that type of thing. It's, it's, it's the same cotton, right? But I already, I have your head. So now I can tell you how much this thing is worth. And I can tell you how much you're worth until you wear this thing, right? If we want to talk about Juju, that's Juju. <laughs> but what you find is that you know, in that our ancestors saw value in particular things, they also know that that value is there. There's a town in Germany that has an, um, I want to say it's an Arushironov or something like that, but it's in their town center. It's in their town, like, and, it, and if you ask the German people, they say it's protecting the town. In fact, if, if anybody was listening, there's an experiment I want you to do. I want to be wrong, but I've checked this website many times and I'm positive it is. If you go to the Vatican website, right? Type in any African tribe you can think of. Igbo, Yoruba, um, Akan, anything like that. And you will find all of those things that they called evil that you went and handed to your church people and your church people went and handed it to their leaders. Kind of thing. All of those things that were, that were labeled evil are all for sale on the Vatican website. Now, I want to be wrong. I want to think that this is not the Vatican. It's so obvious. And it's so obvious that why would I, sitting here in Texas, see this and nobody else see it? It's all the Vatican website. It's all for sale. And it's not for sale for like one, two, three dollars. It's once it becomes the African one, it's thousands, thousands of dollars. Right? But the same, uh, the, the, the Virgin Mary statue will be like 50. $15, $19, you know? But the Nemi, the Nemi, the African one, will be $2,300, $4,000, And the people who are the people there in Europe, there are people, somebody told me this, you know, we had an experience with these people, um, that there are white people in, I'm not going to say where, because then, you know, some people, they're, they're, they're very high, so they might do the thing, but there is an African town, there's a town in Africa where there's um, groups of white people that are just there to buy artifacts. You're able to steal something from your family or bring something from your family and kind of thing, go and sell it to them. And a lot of the church people say, oh, bring all these things, bring all these things, bring all these things. That's exactly where those things go. The smart churches, right? The smart people go sell it and receive their money. So these people know that these things have value, but they have your head. And they've already told you that it has no value. So they can take it for you from cheap and then sell you their own thing for very high. Right? So now you're paying for a shirt what they're making from selling your your, your ancestral legacy. It's it's if again, if someone will say you do is not real or doesn't doesn't exist, there's an example right there. It's strange. It's strange the way it is. Anyway, maybe that is why um as a people, we need to keep searching for, for knowledge, for the kind of knowledge that that bring us out in this world, that sort of represent or the way we really are. All right. Now, talking of knowledge, I'm talking of the responsibility, our responsibility to be able to reshape our history, to tell our story, the way we really are, the way it represents us. <laughs> in, this, in this podcast, I say often that history is only a version of a story. And that version of a story, of course, depends on who is telling the, the story. So there is no uh, one history that talks about the world from without a, every story is partial. Let's just take it like that. So we must tell our story for the partiality where we are at the advantage. That is the only African story. For that reason, like Dr. Ben was saying, I think I said this awful, the European cannot tell African story. Because there is no way he can tell African story. Because story is not just numbers. There are feelings about it. There are sentiments about it. How can you come and put other people's sentiment in your own story? It doesn't work. The Igbo cosmology. What do you want people to know about that? There's a lot to be known. But if somebody is going to walk away with something, right? It is 
the same onyekwe chiekwe, right? That is, if you know, I've been asked often, you know, if there's one thing you want people to know, what's one of it? It's onyekwe chiekwe. Now, what does that mean? What you will, your God wills. Now, what is that? Why is that the one I want them to take walk away with? Right? Is because in this way of understanding, that saying will let you know the relationship an individual has with they want to call it God, the universe, whatever they believe in, right? The relationship they have is that you are not entirely a servant of this thing. There's a two-way relationship. And if, if it says go this direction and you say, you know what, I want to go in this direction, it's coming with you, right? Now it knows why it told you to go in that direction. You understand? So it's not completely, one of the things that I like about um, Odinala and Divo is that, or Odinala to be uh, brief, or Odinani as I call it, because I have a hard time pronouncing the L. But, um, one of the things, um, that I like about it, one of the things that's very empowering is that it allows an individual to take back their agency, take back their agency. I don't need to go to all these different places to know who God is and know God. That God is within me. And the very specific way I believe in God and the very specific language I have around God and the way I connect to God is the way it's supposed to be. Each the world is a person of their chi. I cannot tell you who your chi. I cannot tell you who your God is. That kind of thing. That's not up to me. You look inside yourself and figure out what it is, and learn what it is, and rediscover what it is, and move accordingly. Right. So there's this wonderful um, way that it empowers an individual to know that you are enough. You have what it takes. If you, if somebody is telling you about God and that doesn't make sense to you, there's a reason it doesn't make sense, including myself, <laughs> including myself. I'm not here to convert anybody. I don't care if you, whatever you want to do, I don't care. It's not my business, right? Because if I were here to persuade or convince, I could only talk about the good things. And if I only talk about the good things, I won't be able to tell the full story, right? So I don't care what anybody follows. I'm just telling you the one that makes sense to me and some of the ones that don't make sense. There's a lot of it that doesn't make sense to me, and, I, I, and I'm not particular to it, right? But when it comes to your chi, when it becomes to, you know, we say in, in the Western way, in Abrahamic way of thinking, when you say God, it means like this thing that everybody shares. But in our ancestral way, each person has their own. And all of those <laughs> things come together is the truth. H, and all of those things come together to form a big picture, like you said, the big 360, right? But you will never know that 360 because you will never meet everybody who's supposed to exist and has existed and that kind of thing. Every and you're not, you're not only supposed to. You're not no. supposed to. Exactly. <laughs> and I think you the conflict on the relationship you have with that thing based on <laughs> your truth. But go ahead. I, I think the, the conflict that we're having in the world today is because the Europeans say they know everything about this, about life, about this world. So everybody must know this world according to them. Yes. That is, it is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. Right. You see, when I was much smaller, but then I was uh, still very strong in the, as a Catholic nun. We were going to the church. My father was still going to the church. He never have any problem with us. We could go. We just go. Yes. He, we went there and, because my father had a shrine where he, he reverenced his ancestors. Yes. He never forced any of us to come and join him. Right. Because like you are saying, this is spirituality. Spirituality is not religion. Religion is I know the way. Mine is the only way. Every other thing is wrong. Exactly. Now look at it from a mere common sense. If you if you binge against another, the only thing that will result is conflict. Because if mine is the only way, yours is the only way, then what is the only way? Then I must kill you or fight you so that my way is accepted. But this is wrong. And this is how the West understand uh, God. This is why, for example, for 200 years, there was crusade fighting in the name of God between European and the, and the Arabs. Because they believe that they know the best. The Arabs believe that they... This is not... That is not God. That is man-made God. 
God, as we understand it, of course, again, we are talking as Africans. The way we understand it is you have a direct relationship between you and your God. You do not need anybody to lead you to God. You already know. It, it is inside you. It's not there. It is in there. So yeah. you, don't, you don't need a house. You don't need a fancy car, dressy to go. God, does it, it, this is not what God needs. Please go. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's funny too, because if you ask somebody to describe all the people in the world, they'll tell you that's an impossible task. If you ask somebody to describe every single person who has ever lived, they'll tell you it's an impossible task. If you ask them to describe everything that exists, they'll tell you it's impossible. But almost everybody has a very specific description of God. And God created all these things. God is greater than all these things. So if you can't fathom knowing the names of everybody that's ever existed, how do you fathom knowing the thing that created all those different things? If it, if, if, if it is greater than the, all those individual parts, right? It's like somebody, um, somebody. Uh, I write, I write something down on a piece of paper, right? And somebody can't fathom understanding the complexity of it, but that person will tell you they know everything happening in my head, right? It doesn't make sense. I, as the creator of that thing, I'm greater than that thing I created. But here we are as human beings, and you have these, you know, these belief systems. Very specifically, let me be very specific too. It is a uniquely Abrahamic issue. Because when I talk, I, I, I began a dialogue with many people in um, the, uh, let's call it Hindu religion, right? I have to ask them if, it, I don't even know if that's the term, if that term makes any sense anymore. But in the, his, in the Hindu cosmological science, and they'll tell you, oh, you guys believe this thing. Okay, this is what we call that thing. Oh, okay, interesting. This thing you're describing sounds like that. This thing. Suddenly, there's the, it's we're in the same place again. If I speak, I speak to a lot of indigenous people or people who follow indigenous um, religions, specifically people who understand indigenous belief systems uh, to be uh, Native Americans in America. Oh, you guys call that this? We call that this. Interesting. We call that this. But when you get to the Abrahamic world, it becomes you call that this? Okay, I have to kill you now. <laughs> <laughs> you, is this stupidity i don't know <laughs> yeah you go to nigeria the church people are burning shrines the muslim people are burning churches we it's just it's it's in, you know it's just this cycle it's, it's i think it's a, it's it's in fancy it's, it's a level of infancy perhaps maybe because <laughs> i've never heard of somebody saying oh i believe in amadioha you believe in shango we have to fight if anything, they'll say interesting. You call it Amadioha. We call it so and so. But just to give a, a, a simple example for somebody that are, that is listening to us. Yeah. You see, when you talk of masquerade just now, mm -hmm. you see how I quickly made mention of how we we work with masquerade, how it worked with us. It was not a conflict. If anything, it was a, a, a sort of uniform, a way of saying that it's it's, a, it's an agreement. Yes. This is in line with what you are saying, that if you were to talk to somebody that is a Native American, that is the same thing that is going to tell you. It's not conflicting. Because there is no... It, they are parallel lines. They don't meet. They are just like this. All the lines are going to the center. The 360 degree. Yes. This one doesn't have to come on top of this to be able to go there. Yeah. They are parallel. They are going... This is... Okay, this is Christianity. This is Islam. You don't need to force Christianity on top of Islam to know God. Yes. I think, okay, I think why it is like that, maybe, is because there are a lot of mafia in the system, no? They just want to take advantage of other people. Right, right, right. No, it's not because they want to take people to God. Because if you were taking people to God, why would, why would you, you kill somebody in the name of God? What kind of God are you talking about? I don't understand it. Right. It's funny, too, because, you know, my, my father, I, I was lucky to have the, uh, the uh, parents that I had and the um, upbringing that I had because we never had this. There's a very common conflict in a lot of African families where it's like, oh, all that stuff is evil, evil, ancestry curse, ancestry curse, all that stuff. But we celebrated um, our forefathers. You know, we sat around and we told stories of the people that came before us. So if you told me that. The word ancestor is evil you know i would look at you like you know like 
are you okay? Because it, <laughs> it's only in Nigeria that somebody will believe their grandfather is evil, is a demon, and uh, they themselves are not a demon, right? And so, um, <laughs> when you, I didn't really grow up with this extreme cult, but as I'm doing my channel and I'm meeting more people, I'm seeing that that conflict is a, a major thing. And so, one of the things I was talking to my dad about, I was like, he's like, you know, these church people, every now and then you get this one pastor who loses his mind and starts getting real, uh, you know, a lot of energy. And he goes and cuts down a tree just because the community reveres that tree or says that that tree is sacred or shit. It should not be cut down. He goes and cuts down that tree. Now, why don't we stop that person from doing that thing? I mean, you know, <laughs> and they're not strong. There's a bunch of them and a bunch of old women, right? And um, he told me that in our belief, you don't fight for spirits. You don't fight for spirits. You can invite a spirit to help you in your fight, but you don't fight for spirits. You don't fight for the gods, is what he said. You understand? Because if you have to fight for them, they're not gods. Right? So many of those things <laughs> say <laughs> it's the truth. Many of those that, that is a true that is a true Africa. Yes. A true Africa with a true African spirituality. Yes. Please continue, I, because I love so much what you are saying. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff, man. Trust me, I wouldn't be talking about it if it, if it, if it wasn't what it was. There's, um, it's really unfortunate because it happened in my family anyways. There's a python in my community that you're not allowed to kill, right? If you kill this python by any reason, you have to give it the full funeral of a human being. There are many reasons for this. I go into it in a few of my videos. But one of the ones that I'll talk about now is the fact that that python is the owner of the land, that it was here before we got here, and we're going to respect it as a landlord, right? And so I had a cousin, you know, one thing that the church people like to do is that, you know, they go there and once they, I don't know if it's like frustration or what, but once they get their energy up, they decide whatever these people believe is sacred, I'm going to go destroy it. That's what they always want to do. With it. So there will be like periods of time where people are just trying to kill it in Java. You understand, right? Okay, I'm gonna go kill this python. That's it, just to show you that it's that we we have the real god. That's not. We were never saying the thing was god. We were saying that <laughs> we respect this thing as a landlord. You understand? It was here before us. It maybe it guided us here, and so we're gonna give it the respect it deserves, right? Now here's the funny thing. Again, the tradition is you don't kill this thing, but if you kill it, we're not gonna find you, right? So he kills it. The family gets together. He begins having help for kidney problems um, or what looked like kidney problems because, you know, if you give him the medicine for it, it wouldn't take. It wouldn't work. And we tried many different things, um, including him going abroad. Right. This is constant health issues that, that, that they, we couldn't heal. Somebody said it was because of that time he was going and doing this Nick and Jabba thing that he needs to we need to sit down and um, and rectify situation he caused but because of you know he's a church where he said no i'm not doing it so it was a time that they were setting up to begin um the ritual necessary to appease um the offense he caused and he came and kicked over everything they were doing you know unfortunately this young bright vibrant man passed away last year no explanation like as in we took him many places right many places with my own money right and nothing was happening. My money, my mother's money, just different people in the family, we all pitched in. One of my cousins really went to bat for him. Nothing took, right? Now, maybe one day they'll find what happened. You know, in Nigeria, I don't think we do autopsies as often as we should, if, if ever. And, you know, it's just once somebody dies, it's, oh, this one did. <laughs> yeah, I got it, but that's what they were thinking. So the, we couldn't, ex there was no explanation as to why this thing happened, but many people said it's not a can job, I think, right? Now, why do I say this? There is a chance that somebody killed this snake in the past, saw the result, and said, let's not do this again. And now, because we have decided that every single thing ever said by an African is invalid, we are stepping on in places that there's a reason we were told not to step there. It's like a child decides that, a, a four-year-old decides that their parents are demons, right? And so the parent says, don't touch the stove. Child goes out, what do you know? Touches the stove, burns himself. Uh, don't run in traffic. Oh, what do you know? You're a demon. Goes out, he gets hit by a car. We have, as I'll be specific about Nigeria, we have been, this is what we have been doing for the past 200-ish, 100 years. And look at our condition. Okay, we're modern, right? We're modern. There's no light. Do you know that the <laughs> bitch, <laughs> do you 
know that the British wrote that when no, sorry, Portuguese, I Portuguese wrote that they went to Benin City in Nigeria. And as they were walking through the city, they saw something that they didn't have in their own home was that every few steps there was a lamp that was giving everybody light. Perhaps probably fire, right? Sure. But that they had street lights in this place. You understand? Right now, to get a Nigerian governor in that same state, in, in, in where you're from, anyways, Indo, my own state, any state, to put up street lamps is like a fight. But we think we're wiser. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it's called celebration of stupidity. <laughs> because now, like we were saying before, no, because spirituality is something personal, no? Yeah. By the time you, you want to say, hey, blah, 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 you are using your noise to disturb somebody else. Yeah. Something is wrong with you. Yeah. Because first of all, the God that you are talking to, yeah. why don't you just talk to him without talking to a human being? Oh. <laughs> eh? Okay, now, the people say, this python, they don't kill it because they have a reason for respecting it. You say, no, that python is a devil. <laughs> your God told you to kill the devil. Right. But I don't understand it. You know, this, this, you are right. This Abrahamic religion is a conflict in the world. Is that each of them is trying to be the right one. Mm -hmm. But I think from an African perspective, we shouldn't really be interested. You are the right, but I'm not interested. Because religion is a, no religion, religion, everything about religion, especially this regimentized religion like Islam, Christianity, and the rest of them, mm -hmm. They are, they are very highly militarized, no? We see how the Europeans have used them in many cases, no? But the idea behind it sometimes is, is very disturbing. So, because spirituality was supposed to be something personal, a relationship between you and God. There was nobody, nobody that's supposed to intervene between you and God. Because this is a pers interpersonal relationship. A you and your God relationship. How can you put somebody in the middle? You need to go and read it in a book because somebody has published a book. Right. You made the person rich. Yeah. So for you to know God that was already you, inside you. Somebody that looked like you. But don't even talk of this God that we are... What, he looked to me like an Italian. <laughs> the Jesus I'm talking about, no? If you look... If you are... If yeah. you are a child of God, are you not supposed to be like the God that you are worshipping? Yeah. <laughs> How can you be worshipping somebody that looks like Italian and you are somewhere in Anambra or in Lagos? Yeah. Does it make any sense? Don't we even think at all. Just manage to think. <laughs> the, the funny one you see, and it's funny too because it's more in Africa. You're saying he looks Italian because I think, this is my own thinking, that's as close to being white as Europeans are maybe comfortable with saying this Middle Eastern man looked, right? But if you go to Nigeria, he'll even have red hair. Like, he'll even look Irish. Like, white, 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 you know? <laughs> you know? They'll even draw him with blonde hair. You understand? So you see those differences. In Europe, he looks Italian. In Africa, he tends to look like an Irish or like a Norwegian, right? And you begin thinking, ah, okay, why are we all getting these different images? Even in, even in the fact that we're all presenting this person that doesn't look like us. The one we're presenting is like the the concentrate of the <laughs> of that place. You understand? Because you can see somebody that looks Italian in the Middle East. You can see that, right? You can maybe see someone who looks Italian in Mexico, but you'll have a hard time seeing somebody that looks very Norwegian or Irish in uh, in those places. And except in Nigeria, they'll be worshiping the person. And then in Nigeria, they have this iconography they do a lot, where the devil is very black. In in here, I'm in America. The devil's red. Right? The devil is almost always black. In, in fact, I've heard the term in Nigeria as black as the devil. Because I don't know anywhere in the Bible that even says this person is black. So you always see this thing, there's a statue that you'll see that it's this white guy just stepping on this black man, and you'll see these you know, black people that look like the guy being stepped on celebrating. Ah. <laughs> is is um no, there is no other explanation that <laughs> celebration of stupidity. It is. But let me say something. <laughs> By the time the Europeans came, I'm right now I'm studying the Ekumeku resistance, 
right? The Akumeku resistance was a 30-year resistance or war against the uh, British uh, Empire, right, in Nigeria, primarily in what we call now Delta State, right? Um, and a little bit into Edo as well. And, um, and a little bit in Anambra. And in, in this resistance, or in studying this, there was something that I had already realized this, right? And, but it became very clear in this. By the time the Europeans arrived in Africa, they were 100% done with Christianity, right? The 19, the early 1900s, late 1800s, or 1800s, is not a time of great religious reverence, right? This is the, 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 the beginning of the modern age. Most of the great thinkers of that time, Frederick Nietzsche, all these different people, were staunch atheists, staunch agnostics. It was very, at that time, the church in the West was not something that was taken seriously by the average everyday person. And the colonialists, as I'm seeing in this, this is the ones coming. But they know what that religion did to them for 2,000 years and how subservient it made them to the Pope in Rome. And so what if I take this thing and knock these Africans over the head with it? It'll take them 2,000 years to unbind themselves from this thing the way it took us 2,000 years to unbind ourselves from that thing. By the time the Europeans arrived in Africa, they were not religious people. Frederick Luger and all these ones that they talk about, he was not a religious person. These were not church people. In fact, the colonial administration and the church would often fight, is what I came to see in this Ekumeku thing. They would butt heads. They didn't like each other. But the colonials knew that that church is going to create an effect that is desirable ultimately. And what is that effect? By the time you guys are done talking to these people, they're going to come to me and, and buy a shirt for $2,000 because it came from my hands. Think about it this way. You're a Nigerian. Let's say you're in Nigeria. You grow up. The only white person that you like, you know, you're not in like a city or anything like that. The only white person you're seeing is God. God, right? You're seeing this person every day, every day, every day. They're telling you, well, you're, if you're with this person, you'll be white as snow every single day. And you succeed in life. You become a governor. From there, you even become the president. And you sit down at a table and an Italian man is sitting across from you. Would you be able to effectively negotiate with that person as equals? It can, if that person says, give me your future, you every you have to fight everything inside you to say no. That is your God. That's why I'm saying that when we are worshiping Jesus, at least the kind that the, the European have presented, yeah. it looked to me that we are looking for one Italian man to worship. Yes. That would just make a perfect sense for me. Look for an, an Italian street on the sea. I say, Oh my god, yes, you are my God. <laughs> If somebody that looks exactly, because there's many people that walk around that look like this depiction of Jesus, right? There was a rumor that it was based off of uh, Cesare Borgia. I think I can't say, I'm not going to say the name correctly. It's on my or whatever, but Cesare Borgia, that his face was the model for what we now call Jesus. But that's debated anyway, that kind of thing. But there's many people that walk around with that face. It's, 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 and most Italians that grow their hair out will look like that, right? <laughs> Can you imagine if that person came to 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 emo state <laughs> yes oh yeah that's cool <laughs> that's what it is wanted, they will have there was they, you can't see you're already programmed to worship this human being right i respect the muslims because they said don't draw a lot don't draw the prophet muhammad and when people draw them you know there's fights about it things like that but that's wisdom i don't care what anybody says that's wisdom because the Christians have created a very strange situation in the minds of their own. Now, there are Christians who look or are able to look beyond that. But if you talk to them, their approach, their religion is very spiritual anyway. You understand? So, yeah, go ahead. All right. That's interesting. Uh, actually, we, we, we can go deep on that, but that is for another day. Now, let's talk about the medicine, the medicine share. What do you want, like people to know about that? Because you are doing very interesting programs. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah. So the Medicine Shell is my YouTube channel. You can just search uh, the Medicine Shell. Um, if you search Ebo Spirituality, I'm probably the first person that's going to show up, right? And what the Medicine Shell is, is me taking different concepts in, in Ebo Spirituality, um, the different Abara. So you can you have um, Chineke, which is not an Abara. Chineke is, is God and the creation. Chineke, Chuku, Amadioha, um, Agon, uh, different things like that. And I dedicate a video to them and I just break down everything i can deduce and find on the topic and know and so forth um so i go topic by topic by topic by topic um i infuse history i infuse custom i infuse all these different things to kind of give as much of a whole picture as i can um so that's the medicine shell i've been at it for about two years um those as far as the medicine shell goes if you want to go beyond the videos right um i have a patreon it's at patreon.com slash the medicine shell and on my patreon i keep my library that i use for my research open i'm constantly updating it so right now we have um hundreds of rare books articles first-hand accounts like often i'm outside like there was a man that went to benin and did this there's a man that went to Benin. i have the document there you can go read it the whole story and very interesting stuff right that's available. One of the things I recently started doing too for the patrons is I, because we're, we're talking about the traditional calendars, right? So in your place, they have their five day calendar. In my place, we have a four day calendar. And so what I did was I, I made a digital calendar, right? It lets you know which day is AK, which day is Uriye, which day is Afo, which day is Anqua. Because again, like we were saying earlier, all of these things come with very specific customs right and uh, very specific observances um our ancestors also had a lunar calendar so they did they measured the months by the moons right which is actually how most people in the world began but then like the romans said no you're this month is going to be august augustus because i'm august and i'm gone so you're going to listen to me that kind of thing so but this is the original african lunar calendar right and i put it all in digital form so patrons once you become a patron your google calendar can be up can be can be fused to your google calendar um that type of thing and why did i do all this because i want the medicine shell to be a platform for anybody who wants to go further and embrace um uh african spirituality Igbo spirituality or denani and Igbo. anybody who wants to go further and embrace that thing I, it's all available here right i want to make it all available here i want to make it as easy as possible that kind of thing and like i said the thing pushing me to do it i can't explain what it is it's not to be explained it's a compulsion so um it's what i do it's what gives me joy so yeah that is it that is it you know we are going to find passion for our life we're not going to find the reason why we are here if you find it celebrate it yeah. Celebrating it basically means doing it every day. That is the way to, you know, it's a response to a call. You must find your mission in life. What are you going to contribute to this world that you find yourself? All right. Now, you didn't say something like um, incarnation. This is another interesting thing that um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that because we are moving towards the the end of the conversation just now. Yeah. So earlier I said that me and my cousin were reincarnated from the same person, right? And I used to think this was common knowledge with a lot of people, people but I'm coming to find that a lot of the uh, more Christian families kind of avoid this. So when you're at home, they will tell you who you're reincarnated from, who you are incarnate of, right? Okay, previously you were this person and you've come back. Previously you were that person and you've come back, that kind of thing. And there are certain rules that go with it. So for example, if I passed away, my cousin, I have, there's, I think there's three of us that come from the same person. Uh, they can't come to my funeral. If they pass away, I can't go to their funeral, right? Um, there are certain things that we're going to celebrate together, right? Um, we can't go to the grave sites of the individual who we incarnate from. Uh, we And then if we go to, like, for example, the individual I am in, incarnate of is, um, or incarnated from, is um, from a semi-distant family. We're related by an ancestor removed by four generations, but he was a good friend of my grandfather. And so if I go to his place, they'll call me his name, especially the older women. You understand? You'll have situations where a man will pass away and then will be we'll reincarnate to a little boy and the wife will come and cook for him every now and then. Right? The wife will come and cook for the person now and then. They'll call oh, my husband, you know, that kind of thing. You know, it's very so I I swear I believe it's common, but a lot of people don't know who they incarnate from. So the thing I always tell people, people is, oh, how do I begin? If you are not, because I don't consider people outside of Africa, like in the Caribbean or North America, it's not African. But if you're coming here 
within one or two generations, right? There is a difference then, of course. If you're coming within one or two generations, one of the first things to do is figure out who you're reincarnating from. This is your onye wa, onye wa, right? And so the way that works is that each individual is, I have a video on this too, it's called uh, Reincarnation or Tuluwa, I-L-O-U-W-A, explained, Tuluwa, right? The return to the world, right? That kind of thing. It's also in my Agu, A-G-W-U, H-E-W-U, explained video. Um, and so each person is a composite of four things, right? Chi, you're chi, you're gone, right? That's the spark that brought you into creation. Eke, you as creation, the manifestation of that chi. Agun, which is also known as onyowa, in the, specifically in this case, onyowa. And then mo, which you can call spirit, but is closer to your aura. It's the unseen elements of you. Everybody is a composite of those four things, right? So when you pass away, each part goes back to its source, right? Eke, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, that, 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 that. More, a lot more returns to more. You understand your chi returns to chuku, the big chi. You understand, and then that third part, your ab, your onyuwa, begins the process of trying to come back into the world again. Why? Because this is the part of you that has a purpose and knows your purpose and is in the world for a reason. You brought this up um, a few times. You understand. This is the part of you that has a purpose coming here for a reason, right? It begins the process of reincarnating. And if it did well in the previous life, it will multiply into many children to get the mission done. So think of it like a company. Somebody wants to sell uh, lemonade. My niece set up a stand recently that's selling lemonade and that kind of thing. So somebody wants to sell lemonade and uh, they go through one year of selling lemonade and they do very well. Well, now they can set up three, four, five lemonade stands to achieve this purpose on a bigger scale. If they do well again another year, maybe they can set up uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that kind of thing. But if they fail, maybe the next time they come back, instead of having two, now they have one. We see this with business all the time, right? So your Agu, that part of you, your own Yuwa, that does that incarnating process, it can multiply into multiple people if it did well in the previous. So mine is in three children now. My sisters, the person my sister reincarnated from, I believe there were about five of them, right? And the interesting thing is you'll notice uh, some parallels that you guys will have through life. And if you go to the original family of that person, they'll tell you where that came from. It's a very interesting thing, right? So for example, my sister incarnated from a woman who had no teeth by the time she died. And all of the people who reincarnate, it's very difficult to find people at home that have uh, problems with their teeth, uh, at least compared to the West or the U.S. The U.S., I don't know about Europe, but the U.S. specifically, everybody's got some pain in their mouth, <laughs> right? Um, everybody that reincarnated from this woman all have a lot of problems with their teeth. My wife, her, she incarnated from a blind woman. Everybody that incarnated from this blind woman have issues with their eyes. My wife was bumping into walls at the age of two, that kind of thing, right? So it just happens my son reincarnated from my grandfather, right? And there's a very specific way my grandfather is, and there's a very specific way my son is, and you can't tell me, like, I, I see it, you understand? And so even those people, right, um, uh, uh, the people uh, that you incarnate from the same person, you'll have commonalities, right? One of the things I have in common with the other two is that we like to pull away from the crowd and do our own thing, right? And it's usually something uh, more sedentary, more kind of calmer. So when the other kids would be playing like football, we would go over here and like, I remember we set up like a, uh, like a, we would have grasshoppers, right? And we had a fighting league of grasshoppers. So it started with me and Emeka, we were just doing it. And all of a sudden all the other kids started joining things like that. And that's how it always was with me and Emeka. Like we would always just pull off and do our own thing. Like when we were doing that way chip, not every kid does way chip, but we pulled off, we did our own, we we're taking it very seriously. And then all of a sudden other people were like, oh, what are you guys doing? And it starts spreading and that kind of thing. That was something that we had, the two of us had in common. You understand we work best when we pull away and do our own thing our own way. Um, that type of thing. We're not really uh, hard for us to move with a crowd. That kind of thing. So I have not learned enough about the person I reincarnated from. But during my wedding, when I went back for my wedding, his son came to the wedding. And his son followed me everywhere. 
everywhere. Like we would go everywhere together and he would talk to me like his father. Like he wouldn't talk to me like an elder. This is a 70 some year old man. I'm thinking maybe uh, late 60s. Um, but he would talk to me like his father. You understand? And so that is the uh, reincarnation just from a lived experience. Uh, that kind of thing. That's very interesting though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. That's really very interesting. Yeah. Because this reincarnation is also something that is strong among Asian people, no? among Asian people. Uh, even when you talk of the when K, is it when K you call it uh, where children go to make a ma this this is not the real masquerade now the masquerade of their of children yes we did it all of us did it anyway I don't want to go into that because but I'm I'm trying to see that a lot of pattern here that is sort of common all across now oh, yeah. and where you are coming from is far from where I'm coming from in Nigeria no because Nigeria is not a small village it's a huge country three times the size of Italy no yes how do you know who you reincarnate from. Oh, good question. Um, there's different methods. <laughs> there's different methods. The most controversial is that a lot of mothers will tell you that they themselves know, right? And that one is controversial. People say, no, that's that one is not true, that kind of thing. The second one, but one the, the ones that are more repute or like less controversial, followed more, is they'll use that thought, they'll use divination, right? And they'll figure out who you are. So you this is something that you would go to a DBA for right um another way is um the it, other than afa adibia will take the child and will call the child different names and they'll be mindful of the reactions and then from there they'll know okay this is this person that's coming into the world uh that kind of thing um and so again and it's interesting too because as you grow older you'll now start seeing all these commonalities like uh one is uh my youngest brother my youngest brother has a scar on his head right here he went and met um, the, my uncle, who he reincarnated from, incarnated to three children. He um, met all of them, and they all had some type of scar on their head somewhere, right? So through life, you'll be seeing these patterns that you have with these people. And there's a way that you guys will kind of, like, your life stories will kind of play out in a similar way or the same way with circumstantial nuances, differences, things like that. Um, so yeah, uh, the, but the, the most common and reputed way to do it is going to Adibia and they do divination, they do Afa. Uh, from Afa, they can then know who it is that is returning into the world in the form of this child and so forth. And then also something that I don't make enough emphasis on, some people are coming for the first time, right? Okay. What do you want to say about that? How are they coming for the first yeah, time? So Where have they been? Oh, this why? <laughs> This person is a new strand in the fabric of creation, right? This is a new trend. Think of it like when you're weaving cloth. You take a string, you tie it to a needle, right? Now, the purpose of the thing you're doing is to move that string across a specific pattern. So you're looping up, which is living. Then you die, you loop down, then you loop back up again, and you just keep doing this until you reach the very end. Well, sometimes you begin with a new string. Okay, now we're going to do red. Now we're going to do red. Okay, so you, you loop a red string around the needle, and then you begin the process. So some people are coming for the first time. Some people are, that's my niece there. Uh, some people are coming for the first time. Some people are have been there many times. There's, um, in, in the Igbo language, we say mwasa, like for like, like you typically a very beautiful woman, but like somebody who's very excellent, somebody that just brings excellence and mwasa, that kind of thing, which translates roughly to seventh uh, uh, a child of seven right which means this person has been here seven times and it said that after seven you the, the pattern ends you stop the reincarnating process so this person has been here so many times that they're just they're, you know when i don't know if you play video games or anything like that but if you play a video game that you've played many times you know the first time is going to be difficult if you've played this thing seven times you're you know where all the cheats are and all the little things and you know that kind of thing so somebody who's just moving through the world very easily and, and creating excellence we call Mwasa, that kind of thing that too, that is where we're going to argue for now uh, but we're going to come to it next time uh to dig it up more uh, more let's talk about the language um, tell us something, give us the basis of Igbo language for people who maybe want to start or maybe want to understand the basis of Igbo language. Then I'll ask you a few things from there. Right. So one of the things, you know, I said earlier that spirituality now reforms the way I approach things. Right. And so one of the things I've realized is that my desire to have the Igbo language taught effectively 
um, is not for me to aggrandize myself with it, right? So I'm going to give you some of the tips that we use at Kedu to effectively teach people, but it goes into understanding the Igbo language itself, right? So one of the approaches we use, and I don't care, I want somebody to start uh, a medu.me or a this do or whatever they want to do and copy exactly, I don't care. Go ahead, I don't care, right? The one of the things that um, we do, right, is we we study the language as the language, not I'm trying to learn a language. No, this Igbo language has a different nature than English and you know the, the different languages and that. What are one of the things in the nature of the Igbo language? In the Igbo language, the our ancestors put to get the language together or found their inspiration, whatever they call it by trying to say as much as possible with one single word. So in English, there is a pride the English language takes at having many words. Oh, we can describe everything. There's a word for everything, that kind of thing. Dictionaries are extremely thick, that kind of thing. Whereas with the Igbo language, you can take one word like ke, and you can say seven, 10, 20 different things with just that word, just that little tiny root. You understand. So instead of teaching people with Kedu, we don't go, um, oh, um, voila, is car. This is that. This is that. That's not how we're going to do it with Kedu. That's not how we do it with Kedu. What we do is we give that we we isolate those words that allow you to say a hundred things, right? And what you come to find is that they're all verbs. The Igbo language is a verb-based language. Everything is an action, right? Uche. I'm sitting on an uche, right? But the verb in uche is che, which is to wait or to be still, right? O, if you see o in front of something, it usually, its purpose of existing is actualizing the verb that follows. You understand? Oche, something that exists to make me say still. Oh, chair. You understand? But if I say chair, that means wait. Now we're not talking about a chair at all. You understand? Onyen che. A security guard. So when you t we teach people those little those roots, che, and then from once the person becomes comfortable being able to say it and be confident and being and understanding what it is, you now start showing them all the things they can do with that tiny little tool, right? So rather than beginning with the alphabet, we begin by teaching the verbs. That's the actual alphabet. And those verbs unlock this thing where you can say thousands of things. In a, you can learn thousands of words in a very short amount of time if you know how to play with verbs, right? The Igbo language, and I'm finding a lot of different African languages are very mathematical. In math, there are only nine digits, 10, if you want to say 10, sure. There are only 10 digits. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But with those nine digits, you put them together in different combinations and you make an infinite amount of numbers. So if I learn how to count to 100, I have also learned how to count to uh, 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 1 billion because it's the same pattern. I'm, I'm doing a lot with very little amount of digits. It's not that every single word has its own, uh, every single number has its own symbol, which is how English approaches language, right? So in doing that, right, in understanding the nature, again, infusing my ability to research in what I do, in understanding the unique nature of the Igbo language, it then allows us to teach it very effectively. We have people who have never heard the language in their life, but perhaps they took a DNA test or they maybe something else saying on my channel resonated with them. They signed up for Kedu and they're speaking Igbo right now, three months, within three months, because of that, because you, you understand how it is. And you'll see it at home, too. You'll notice at home, the, an individual will speak. It's not uncommon for someone to speak three, four languages, right? The minute somebody goes to the north, give them less than a year, they can speak Aosa. And then you go to Yoruba land, give them maybe a year, two years, they're speaking Yoruba. You understand? It's common because we, uh, as Africans, understand the rhythm of our languages. And it's easy for us to pick up other languages for that reason. There's something we understand about language. That is not understand out, understood outside. You understand. I, I like I like the way you you dance to that rhythm. That is very important. <laughs> there is power there. <clears throat> but it is really very interesting, you know, when you were looking at the the Igbo language as an action language, you no, know, that it is uh, uh, vowels 
and it is uh, all action based. Mm -hmm. This pattern is it peculiar to the Igbo language, or is it something that is common along the language in the geography? Um, I think any language in the Kwa language family, they call it Kwa language family, um, is going to have that pattern, right? It's going to have that pattern. And let me let you know now, we're all the same people. <laughs> we're all the same people. When you, when you get past the trivialities, right? Oh, in, uh, 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 in Delta State, they wear a British bowler hat at their traditional attire. And in this state, they wear a red cap. That's a joke. Okay, so they're different, you know? Oh, Yoruba, they say AT um, uh, or something like that. And Igbo, they say T. They're different. When you go as far as I've gone, you come to find that, oh, these are the same people. These are all the same people. So these rules I'm talking about, I can go ahead and make a guess and say that between what we now call Nigeria and what we now call Ghana, the rules are going to be the same. Now, I'm willing to say it goes well beyond that, but I'm, I think most African languages in that zone are verb-based languages, and you learn them quicker focusing on the verbs. Also for the language, <clears throat> we're going to have time to dig more on that uh, also on another occasion. Now, tell people, how can they connect with you? Maybe they want to know more about what you do. I don't know, you have some courses out there. They want to take some of the courses. They want to support you. Why don't you? Well, you are doing a great work. Uh, tell them how to support you. Promote yourself in these few seconds. Cool. Obey, well, thank you very much. So if you're trying to get a hold of me, uh, search me on YouTube, The Medicine Shell. Just spelled exactly how it sounds, The Medicine Shell. I am also on Twitter at Shell Medicine on Instagram as The Medicine Show. And then of course, if you want to study further and uh, support the channel, the best way to do it is on patreon.com slash The Medicine Show. My patrons have access to my in-house library, the Odinani digital calendar, and then our Odinani group study where we get together and we discuss these topics as they apply to life and things like that on um, every two weeks. And that's my, it's my favorite part of the month is doing that, right? So all of that is available on YouTube. Medicine Shell, uh, Twitter, Shell Medicine, uh, Instagram, The Medicine Shell, and then Patreon.com slash The Medicine Shell. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. You can see a lot of commonality in our culture. Uh, so we really need to be digging in more to, to find out that we, all of us are really one. Or we can live beyond this artificial barrier that is out there. Because if you look at it from the point of view of language now, you can take it off from the point of view of uh, of of, uh, of our spirituality our um, the way we, we are basically set up as a people we are the same we are the same people uh, even the language even though we might speak it differently it doesn't necessarily say that we are different because there are a lot of commonality in it right. and, and we can do this when we look beyond the artificial barrier that are out there so now to those people out there particularly in the diaspora who want to learn more about their root what would you recommend? Because you, you are in the United States. You are not in, in Oka or maybe in a quiet state. You are doing all this one in the United States. I am in Italy. I'm doing what I'm doing. You, know? you don't need to necessarily be in Africa before you can do African project. Yeah. So what was your recommendation for them? Yeah. Um, recommendation is usually to start from a point, right? So if you are trying to learn about Africa, you're not, you're not going to learn anything. Uh, because it's like trying to drink a lake. <laughs> you understand? Uh, you have to start from a point of interest or a point of whatever. Uh, but if you're trying to reconnect to your culture and so forth, um, there's a, we are like you said, we're in, we're past the age of physical geography. So there's a lot online to uh, look at and assess. Um, and one of the best ways to start is just looking online in at your culture or what you're interested in. Um, of course, verifying, not verifying, I, I don't like that word anymore, but checking it with multiple sources and that kind of thing. So uh, search online, just like anything else, search online. Um, if you're interested in the spiritual aspect or the spirituality, the very first thing you must do is learn the name of your ancestors. Learn the name of the people that came before you in order, right? So you're never it's a lifelong journey. You're never going to learn them all, um, but just spend your life learning as many of them as possible. That is the beginning of everything. The next thing, if you are, only, maybe say you've only been removed by one or two generations from home, go and find out who you reincarnate from. That is a good message that is left out there. Do you want to add anything to conclude the conversation? This is the last statement. I think we've had a really good conversation. Um, 
nothing is really coming to mind other than me thanking you for this opportunity. Um, I was binging a few episodes uh, last week and you, the work you're doing is beyond phenomenal because so many people out there are doing different things, but you're giving them uh, a stage for everybody to see the full picture because all of these different perspectives are coming to one place. So thank you for what you're doing. I, I don't doubt that you will be our CNN in due time, <laughs> our Larry King in due time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's already in you. So thank you. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate our review overhead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain over here at one Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.